As, as somebody who's knowledgeable about movies for a very, very long time, I miss Bob Osborne because he was he, he started this and he went with it and he was he was pretty much everything I know about whatever it is about movies I learned from him. On TCM with Robert Osborne, which was a true highlight for you. A highlight, a pinch me moment, a bucket list, you know, whatever you want to call it. The, the hair on the back of my neck still stands up when I think about Robert Osborne in that chair, and Ron Perlman in this chair, talking about Frank Capra, Howard Hawks, George Stevens, and Preston Sturgis. And, and you were telling me it's almost like just the questions he was asking you and the way he was talking to you got you to open up about these movies and why you love them, maybe in ways that you didn't even expect to be talking about. You know, I was so nervous because, of, you know, I'm, I'm such a, a classic movie freak, but I'm a real Robert Osborne groupie. And um, I kept going back and forth, like, should I prepare what I want to say about each of these films? And then I said, I think, why don't I just leave it to Bob? And I'm just going to listen to the questions and try to be interesting and, and, and real and honest, convey. And that's all I needed to do. I mean, he's, he's, he's quintessentially a, a film freak. He loves them authentically and, and unabashedly. And if you just look in his eyes, he guides you like, well, what was it about this one that made you pick it? It got really good. It was, you know, I was very proud of that. I just remember when I got to guest host with him 10 years ago for 31 Days of Oscar, and I remember thinking, like, this, he's going to be like, who's this kid? He could not have been more lovely and welcoming and gracious and funny. He, I had a blast with him. So, okay, you told me you saw When Harry Met Sally in the theater 30 years ago. Have you seen it a lot since? Have you seen it in a theater since? I've not seen it in the theater since. I've, I, like all of us here, have seen clips of it. Like, <laughs> I'll have what she's had. <laughs> um, and other clips from it, because it's a classic film. It's great that you're honoring it as such. And it has classic moments, which is what a classic film is. One of the, one of the many you know, guiding forces of what makes the movie a classic. And uh, so, no, I'm looking forward to seeing it in a theater from beginning to end again. Well, thank you for being here. You're such a great supporter of TCM. Ron Perlman. And Dave Parker. Yeah, my second year. Very second, second year in a row. I know it's been ten years, but for years I didn't come because I felt a little shy about it. But uh, then last year I thought I'm missing out on a whole.
wonderful big uh, community there for five days where people like me, five o'clock West Coast time, I flip it on. It has to be something really whack for me to turn it off because I just like enveloping myself in it for three movies and I don't watch it all. It's on in the background. I'll read, I'll put the baseball on for a second, but I always come back to it. And I don't know, I just find it like popcorn. It's a refreshing way to spend an evening. It feels calm to me before the whole world got so fractious. I like it when uh, I like it when people break out into song and nobody's embarrassed. <laughs> you know, they'll be walking down the street. Do you that, that, that. Like, yeah, that's what we need, more musicals. Um, because it, it leads to um, 
a, a movie version of what had been an incredibly successful Broadway show for Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, yes. That was pretty weird. I couldn't believe it. They said, um, we want you to do a screen test for this movie that we're doing called Oklahoma. I said, really? Yeah. So I did the screen test. I sang and did the screen test. And um, right afterwards, uh, Richard Rogers came up to me and said, Miss Jones, you got the part. I said, I did? <laughs> they said, yes. And that's how it started. So I'm gonna, so people understand, because most actors have these horrible audition stories. Mm -hmm. And you basically have two audition stories. <laughs> where, <laughs> where you're leaving, to, where are you going to go, Penn State? Yeah, and we're gonna go to Penn State yeah. to be in that yeah. a great life. Exactly uh, right. And instead, they're like, oh, hold on, the two most important musical right. uh, men of the 1950s say, hold on. And then, then a couple years later, you do one screen test, and they're like, you got the part. Yeah. Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> I didn't think it worked that way either. That was a shock. Where's the suffering? Just a good looking How was uh, Frank to work with uh, as an actor? Uh, Frank was not the most fun I've ever had working with uh, <laughs> as an actor. He, uh, he, liked, he was a musician, so he was perfect. Musicians are perfect. You know, they have to be. They have to be on pitch. They have to hit the right note. Athletes and musicians are not actors. We fake everything, but yeah. they don't. And so uh, Frank knew his work so well that uh, he didn't help you much <laughs> to help yourself. And uh, we did the scene with uh, him and me at the uh, cocktail table, and we did a close-up on him after we did the scene, and then turned around and did a close-up on me. And when I finished mine, he got up and walked away, as we do when the scene is finished. And I said, well, I'd sure like to try it again, if you don't mind. And they said, uh, where's Frank? And they said, oh, he split. <laughs> so he didn't even hang around to wait to see if I wanted to do it again. He knew he had it nailed. But I felt I could have been better in that scene. So uh, I, I talked to... Uh uh, Billy Bob Thornton about this, um, who's a you know big fan of Frank for the music and the performances also, about why Frank was famously uh, stingy about takes, like he wanted to do it once and he didn't want to do it again. And I thought, and Billy Bob Thornton agreed, it was just an interesting conversation, that, that there was some insecurity in Frank, that if he did it again, or you know, like if he pulled a Brando and did 40 takes, that, I don't know, he'd get exposed, even though he was obviously a talented actor, but that, that people would see through him. Something kept him from those extra takes that, that might have made him even better. You think, you, you know, oh, been, you think that's true? <laughs> Bullshit, you said? Mm -hmm. No, it was great talking. <laughs> Angie Dickinson, everybody. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so, okay, so I'm just, I, I'm reading too much into it. Uh, no, I think Billy Bob Thornton is right. I think it's just the opposite. Being a singer, singing on pitch, and the exact lyric that he's supposed to sing, and so prepared to do a recording uh, that he knows when he's good, and when he got it, and why would he do it again? And uh, certainly not for me, and he didn't need it again. No, I think it's absolutely, uh, I don't think he's right at all. Um, all right, that's good, that's great. Uh, I, that's, that's useful information. I don't tell him I said that. No, I, uh, <laughs> Okay. I, 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 who I, by the way, he's a great actor. Yeah, he's a sensational and a talented actor. man, but he just doesn't know Frank Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> so then, after you guys do Ocean's Eleven, first of all, tell people what that, what the madness of making that movie was shot in Las Vegas. Oh, How yeah. would that go? Oh, it was uh, incredible of you, because you've all seen. I'm sure you've seen the movie, and uh, and they just. Uh, uh, pull tricks on each other constantly. Cherry bombs under the 
the poker table or the craps table was it? The craps table, I think. They would, and Frank was usually the monster there because he could get away with it. What are you going to do? <laughs> Tell him not to do that anymore. And so he was naughty. But he loved being naughty and he loved uh, uh, playing with his friends. And as you all know, uh, or certainly most of you, that then they went on after shooting from 11 to 7, they would take a bit of a break and then do their show at the Sands Hotel. And two, it was, two shows a night. Was it two shows I, a night? I, I watched you, Frank Sinatra was filling in for Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show and you were a guest and you can watch that on YouTube. And yeah, that's what he said, two shows, two shows a night and then partying afterwards and then on the set by 11 to try and make this movie. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so I went, uh, I saw it five times, at least. I think more. And there was what? It was Frank and Dean, Sammy, Lawford, and Joey Bishop? Was that they all did? That's exactly right. Uh, and once it, uh, Dean said, you want to watch from backstage. So one night I watched from backstage, and uh, they were laughing. They were, they were having the time of their lives from the minute they started the show until they finished. They really had that brotherhood to the ultimate. Um, every night, they really loved each other, loved each other's work, and loved playing with each other. So, at what point, I really don't know the answer to this, so at what point, because I, you know, now you, you in your, I don't know whether people know this about Angie, but you, you were offered a lot of money to write an autobiography, right? You've led a very exciting, successful life, and you started it, thought about it, and then gave the money back, right? Well, I, you know, I, I, I had them tell me it has to be juicier. Right. And I said, bye. You <laughs> forfeited. <laughs> 75,000. 75,000? No, that's not that much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Nothing. So what hurt, what hurt was the 10% to Swifty Lazar. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, so, but you have for long really hesitated to, to tell some stories about people who matter to you, but I just read that, um, that you, there was a time then after Ocean's Eleven where you really fell for Frank. You called him the most exciting man who... Oh, yeah. Right. He was the most exciting man, pardon me, and I'm the one who asked for these chairs. <laughs> <laughs> he was the most exciting man on earth, I really swear. Uh, and, and, and that doesn't mean the funniest or anything like that, but he, yeah, he was, he just was an exciting man. And that didn't mean I wanted to marry it. Right, but but that was a possibility for a bit. It was a possibility. We did use the M word. <laughs> and uh, I didn't want to be married uh, to Frank because I knew I would have to live his life and not mine. And I wasn't through, I hadn't hit the high points yet, and I wasn't ready to, uh, well, bless you, <laughs> thank you, uh, I was, uh, you know, still of child variation, actually, but said we didn't have a baby, oh, Jesus, <laughs> I, mean, I was not ready for that, I was trying to be a movie star. Who read the heart they that's who we probably who where any office boy or young mechanic can be a panic with just a good-looking pan. This movie so amazing. I take it that because their relationship had already progressed, they'd already they met in 1979, she was going to be in this movie, right? Or was that uh, was yes. that not set? No, that was set. So Woody and, and Mia for That's this set. one is, is set. Yeah. Uh, how was their, they made 12 or 13 movies together, so 12 or 13 movies with you then, right? Yes. Um, uh, how was their uh, working relationship? Good. Yeah, they did, you know, I think it's very good. And I mean, I think that they probably talked this through quite a bit because they used to frequent a restaurant in New York called Rayo's, mm -hmm. pretty famous Italian restaurant. And Mrs. Rayo, who was the original chef, was ba Mia based that character on Mrs. Rayo, who so would be, you could see her when you walked into the restaurant, you could see her in the kitchen stirring the ragu, 
with a cigarette hanging out of her mouth and her hair piled on top of her head. And that's who Mia based the character on. That's really great. And maybe that was where Woody got his idea for the character. Where any office boy or young mechanic can be a panic with just a good looking pan. Apocalypse Now, uh, 1979, one of the, I, I think, uh, uh, nearly t uh, 20 films you've collaborated on with uh, Francis Ford Coppola, either as a casting director or mostly as a producing partner. During Apocalypse Now, um, a month in, you've shot, production is underway, you talked about the bumps in the road, pretty big bump in the road, you gotta, you guys decide to, what, recast the lead? Yes, uh, Harvey Keitel, not too many people know this, but Harvey Keitel played the major role of Willard for the first month of shooting. And at a certain point, Francis and I both kind of decided it wasn't working. And uh, most filmmakers would have just soldiered on and sucked it up and kept going with, with what might have been a mistake. Uh, but Francis decided to close down the picture and recast the lead. This is nothing against Harvey Keitel. He's a great actor. <clears throat> uh, and always was and always will be. But it just wasn't working for that role. <clears throat> um, so we had considered we had considered Martin Sheen for Godfather and we we knew him. Uh, and so we decided to fly back to LA. We were in the Philippines. Fly back to LA and talk to Marty and see if we if he's the right person to bring back to. And Fran and it was kind of a big thing to do and we didn't want the press to hear that we had done this. And so Francis <clears throat> shaved off his, his whole beard and mustache and we could go anywhere in LA and Hollywood at any restaurant and nobody recognized him. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the point. And then we, we met with Marty and decided it was the right thing to do and we took Marty back and uh, Marty was great in the role. It's not a question of who was a better actor between Marty and it was just who was right for the character. I didn't know the disguise part. So you did show up in the gossip columns, and here, I'll, I'll read from this one, it says, until recently, Diane Baker refused to go to parties if her steady, Dennis Powers, couldn't accompany her. But he's gone back to Occidental College and has such a heavy scholastic schedule, he can see her only on weekends. They've reached an understanding that D Diane may have to go to some parties and premieres when Denny can't attend, so she'll go with another boy. Quote, I suppose each time the gossip columns will say I have a new romance, sized I am. So, I, so uh, what happened to Denny? Denny and I went together from high school, so he was my sweetheart all through high school. I can cry thinking about it. When I met him at the, come in our little lunchroom, I had to find out who was this kid, this guy who was 15 years old, and we were introduced. So I joined every club at high school. We near him. The ski club, I had no idea about how to ski. <laughs> so I used to clock him uh, coming down Kratka Ridge in the, and all mammoth and all that. I used to clock him. He was, it would have been in the Nationals. Uh -huh. And he was a, a jock. He was uh, all city of LA. He ran, <coughs> jumped, and played football. So uh, I, Denny and I were not going to get pulled apart by this. Mm -hmm. I wanted to act. He wanted to be an art director and film mm -hmm. maker himself. Yeah. He got 
pulled into New York uh, to work with an ad agency when he ended up being vice president of Young and Rubicam. Wow. And he was responsible for uh, the Dr. Pepper commercials where he came, got to come to Hollywood and he pulled me in and said, you have to watch me film the Dr. Pepper scenes of Singing in the Rain with a young actor. He got to use the lot and uh -huh. did the whole thing. At oh. my, so he became an incredible film commercial film director. Hmm. We never stopped seeing each other through the years, and we're back together.
and they realized they had a certain rhythm with each other, and they started doing who's on first with each other, and made each other laugh, and um, then they split to go back on the road with their respective partners, and then ultimately they decided that they should be with each other. Yeah. yeah. And they, um, the, the thing was around for a long time, I think, who's on first. There's a guy in this movie, he writes special material. What John Grant, was, John Grant. Was, he was the uh, writer, and to my knowledge, his specialty, I think he was a, originally a vaudevillian himself, but his specialty was to take these uh, routines that were out there, like the lemon bin mm -hmm. and who's on first, and I think in the movie tonight, is it 40 and 10, yeah. I think he also had something to do with that too, so he tailored it specifically for Abbott and Costello. Yeah, he would come in, the basic bit would be there, he'd be Mr. Miyagi, trim it back, bonsai, get it in great shape, and then when you mix in their alacrity of language, it's so funny, when you think of Costello, you think of him as sort of like, uh, I, I don't know, I always think physical comedian, bit of a tough little cat, but boy, the speed, the rat is oh, it's absolutely it's beautiful. beautiful. And it's kind of fascinating because back then, uh, all of this stuff was regional. You know, so you could have bits that played in different regions, and like nobody knew that the guy that they were seeing doing it wasn't <laughs> like making some spot, right? Uh, so yeah. Yeah, you're right. It, that due to social media and that the whole world's available was <laughs> instantaneously back then. If somebody was doing it in the Northeast Power Corridor, nobody knew about it in the and Mississippi Valley. Exactly. Right? exactly. And so like different comics would do the same. Routine. Yeah, right? Smith and Dale doing the Dr. Cronkite routine forever. And that was what they went around to every city doing, and it was fresh and it was new to those specific locales. I do know that when they were in Vaudeville, that the split, unbelievably, and let's face facts, there is the business part of show business, the split comes down to Abbott at 60 and Lou at 40. And that sticks in Lou's craw for the rest of his life. And he finally, you know, all of a sudden, Abbott turns into Andrew Ridgely, to Lou Costello's George Michael and Wham. And Lou, Lou wants to change it to Costello and Abbott. Universal says no. And he says, listen, I'm not going any further with this, unless, unless this is a 50-50 show. Well, back then, they thought that the strength man was the strength of the, uh, of the act. And that the funny guy was like a lesser form. He just did the punchlines. And that's why it was like that. It was standard throughout that time. Well, Abbott, um, I, I know, lives to be 76. Lou goes much earlier in the night, because it seems like me. He was kept doing the heavy lifting there. Abbott, the uh, last <laughs> till he's uh, 76, Groucho ends up calling him the best straight man ever. Yeah. And I hear these stories, and I, I think it's sweet when they say that the straight man's the most important part. But I, I gotta tell you, you can lead a horse to water, but somebody's gotta issue the coup de grace. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of two Bud Abbots on stage. Where's Bud Abbots? Mr. Miyagi both showed up in well, this conversation. I, I'm just saying, if there were two Bud <laughs> Abbots on stage, it'd be walking out, it'd be Ibsen's dollhouse or something. You know? but if there's two Costellos, it might be a little manic, but you're at least laughing your ass off. <laughs> so the whole thing about the straight man is good up to the point, but somebody's gotta do the. <laughs> Robert Osborne knew a lot about movies, I, more than anybody up here, um, but if there is a uh, close competitor, uh, it is the woman I'm bringing up now. She really is, we're so fortunate to have her, Alicia Malone. Uh, okay, so uh, everybody have a glass? So raise your glasses. Here we go. By the way, our photographer here lost her voice this weekend, yelling at us all. Uh, thank you, so here we go. Uh, happy 10th, uh, Happy 25th anniversary. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've decided to keep the bar open.